Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining the Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, as always, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining us. So today I have Peter Christensen with Builders Trust Capital. He's joining us. They, um, you know, my day job over at Veravest. Um, these guys are, are recent members, new members. So we're excited to have them on board. I've known Peter for probably 12, 18 months when him and his crew were in the process of, of launching a, a mortgage pool fund or a debt fund. Um, so known these guys for a bit and, uh, super excited to have them on the show to sort of talk about what it is that they're up to. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy what we've got in store here for you. So, so Peter, as, as always, we usually like to jump in and kind of just get sort of the backstory, you know, how did you get in, you know, you guys are private lenders, uh, <clears throat> based on the East coast. Um, you know, how, how did you end up kind of getting into real estate? how did you get into lending? Um, you know, what, what sort of drew you to it? And, and uh, I was curious where that sort of comes from. Yeah, sure. And th thanks for having me, Lance. Happy to be here. Um, so it actually started back in 2011. I think my, I'll give you the full long story. My wife and I bought a, we're looking for some kind of an alternative investment to not just kind of the public equities or bond markets. And we bought a turnkey rental property actually down in Florida in Jacksonville. So it's a, uh, it's a shop down there. They're still very much active and we bought it. So they had basically, you know, bought distressed. It was a turnkey rental uh, with the management included. So we bought that. We liked it. Um, we had it for about a year and then we thought we just, we like real estate investing in general, but obviously it's cash intensive intensive to just buy turnkey rental properties. So then I connected with Anthony Susco, who is one of the other management partners of Builders Trust Capital. And we went to college together and always wanted to do something after college. So we connected and we started then figuring out ways to invest in real estate. So we actually started out by wholesaling. Uh, this was back in probably 2012. Mm. So we did, you know, the yellow letter campaigns and, you know, kind of boots in the ground marketing, knocking on doors, that kind of thing. Mm. And we did pretty well. I mean, I think that's in my mind, like the only true way of really investing in, not that it's necessarily investing, but you can get involved with real estate with very little money out of your pocket, right? It's, it's more time and energy. So we found some good deals. We wholesale them. And then we thought, Hey, you know, we're doing pretty well, but the people buying them are doing even better. So why don't we just buy the deals instead of wholesale them? So then we started doing that. And actually the first couple we did were uh, rental properties. So they were distressed. We bought them, you know, direct to seller, fixed them up, refinanced them, and then they became rental properties. Now, keep in mind back in 2012, you did not have the same kind of 30 year DSCR programs that exist today. Yeah. So it was actually a real struggle for us to get the takeout financing. So, you know, quote unquote, hard money existed back then. It existed at kind of like 14 and four right? Um, not the super aggressive, more institutionalized approach that we have now. So that's basically what we did. Um, we called probably, I don't know, a hundred local banks and credit unions to try to get the takeout financing. And we eventually did. And so then we kind of started scaling a rental portfolio. So again, the lending parameters back then were different. So kind of effectively executing the Burr strategy was a little bit more difficult because you know the, the, the guidelines and parameters were different. Yeah. So we were leaving cash in every rental. So then the progression was like, okay, we need more capital, right? Because we want to scale this rental portfolio. So how about we do some flips to get you know those yeah. kind of more lumpy cash uh, infusions so that we can keep growing the rental portfolio. So that's what we did. So then we started doing some flips. Then, and, and that worked well. Um, obviously you need capital to do flips as well. Um, so we started actually doing some, um, some spec builds, which is again, totally different kind of ballpark, but we, we did that. The first one we did was uh, do one of Anthony's connections. We had a burned down house. You know, we bought that, that's what we bought. We knocked it down, we built new and it worked out well. Um, so then during that time, we secured some equity investments to, to fund the equity needed for these deals. Right. And so worked well. Um, we were successful in, in kind of executing that strategy. And then at the time, Anthony and I were both working full time kind of 
you know, quote unquote day jobs in addition to doing this, which was, you know, so it was a lot of work. Um, and we wanted to scale and we kind of looked at everything we're doing. We thought, okay, scaling, um, being an operator and scaling is doable, but it's very difficult for a lot of different reasons. And the cash flows are tricky, right? We both had wives um, and, you know, wanted to have families and things like that. So we did not necessarily think that we would be able to scale as quickly as we ultimately would like, right? I think there's some anecdotes that probably means that that is true considering, you know, a lot of the HGTV stars and all these other, you know, professional flippers usually end up doing education. Yes. Um, but um, so in any event, we, um, we then thought that, you know, so we had borrowed private money, right? And then we also had borrowed from banks. So for some of the spec homes yeah, and these spec homes uh, that we had financed with a bank, it was, you know, I was actually thinking about this morning, like on paper, it was cheaper because the rates and points and things were lower. But I think the process during the construction phase and everything else actually made it not, it, it did not, it wasn't the ideal way for us to borrow money in yeah. doing what we're doing. And our private lender was good, but left some things to be desired as well. So we kind of thought, you know, we've been operators. We know what it takes. I think maybe we can do this better. So then we transitioned the equity capital we had into lending. And in the beginning, it was, it was basically on a participation basis, right? So they would go on the loan with us. And, and that's how that was structured. Who's the they? Um, like the they so investors. Okay. Okay. The they, so the equity investors would come on to deals with us. Right. So we would show them our kind of our underwriting of the deal. They would come into the deal with us and that's how that worked. Okay. Um, which that is also very difficult to scale because it becomes kind of a puzzle, right? Because then you have a payoff and then, you know, you need to allocate the capital to a new deal and you need to send it back. And so it worked well. We got into a, a position where we had more deal flow than we had capital. So then we started selling some notes, right? We would just sell the whole note. So to re recoup the capital, lend it out again, so on and so forth. That then led to a more formal, actually correspondent lending arrangement with a couple of different takeout investors. And we secured a warehouse line of credit mm. uh, with a very high advance rate. So it took then, relatively speaking, less equity for us to keep lending. So you know, doing that, we kind of, I think, um, matured the company in terms of our processing and underwriting, because we're now underwriting to some, some pretty high kind of securitization level standards, I would say, in terms yeah. of documentation and appraisals and fraud guard and everything else. Um, so fast forward now, we're in early 2020. We wanted to scale that business. Um, we're doing five, six million a month. Uh, in originations. And now we also, we onboarded a DSCR program as well. So now we're doing both short-term kind of mm. fix and flip bridge lending and also 30-year DSCR loans. Um, our takeout investors, you know, we're buying both products. Our warehouse provider was okay with us doing both products. So that, that's what we did. So we then, we wanted to scale and we, we kind of got stuck a couple of different places. So we actually consulted with Jerry O'Brien, who, um, had various senior roles in the kind of the mortgage space. Most recently before he joined us, he was with Genesis. And so he came on board with us as a consultant. And again, now this is like January, 2020, right? Yeah. He was consulting with us for about two months when COVID hit. So March, 2020, I think it was March 13th, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're now in the midst of doing basic correspondent lending on a warehouse line and take out investors are not buying essentially, right? They press pause because the capital markets are dislocated and no one knows what's going to happen. You know, it's just, we, we realized at that point that not having discretionary capital can be tricky in terms of, you know, your operations and just continuity of your business, right? So we were lucky to pretty much clear our balance sheet right then. We had, you know, some good relationships and, and we got, you know, we were in a good spot. We didn't kind of have to take, we didn't end up with a bunch of orphan loans that we had to sell at you right. know, 85 or whatever, uh, some, um, yeah. yeah, some other lenders I know ran into what it highlighted to us though, was that our business model was not ultimately what we wanted, right? Because we were relying on these takeout investors. So then 
we had thought about the idea of launching a fund for a couple of years, but we had kind of put on the back burner because the correspondent model could be pretty lucrative. And it was maybe one of those things, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. And we didn't foresee COVID. Yeah. So, um, so then what happened in between basically March and August of 2020 is that Jerry joined us as a third managing partner. And then we worked on the fund, launching the fund, structuring the fund, and then eventually launching what is now Builders as Capital in August of 2020. So yeah. maybe longer story than you would like, but that is no, that's no, the full story of how we kind of got to where we are. So now... Yeah, and I, I like the stories too because it, it shows that in the real estate game, it's very interesting, right? And you'll, you'll usually see this. It's either started out as equity events or moved to debt, debt moves to equity, right? But you see that a lot of the people who are seasoned, it's that, you know, we say in the business, the capital stack, right? It's just understanding that, right? Like there's the capital stack, you don't know, right? It's just that there's people that are sort of in a liquidation scenario, right? Someone's going to get paid first and second and third and whatever. And so, and of course, that you know, the sooner you get paid back in a liquidation scenario, you're taking the least amount of risk, and and that's where you know first position debt comes in or whatever. But understanding that how any given transaction, you know, a real estate acquisition transaction is, you know, what's necessary to what's the business malt plan for that, how you're going to capitalize that, um, you know, the how long the debt exists. I mean, all those things really change the risk profile of any given of any given deal. And so I think it's interesting, you know, if, if you're a passive investor and sort of getting into this sort of thing and trying to figure it all out, it's just, it's understanding and appreciating that. So when you come in contact with people who are saying what they're doing, those are the things you want to see what their experience is with these, you know, up and down the capital stack, so to speak. Right. So here in a story like yours and Anthony's, Right. It's like you guys were in the trenches. I mean, like you knew what it was like. You ran into these constraints, you know, and you talked a lot about scalability. Right. It's just it's mm -hmm. it's just it's trying to build a business around this. It's not just, you know, like, oh, you flipped the house and you made a bunch of money. OK, great. I know. But is that a sustainable business? Right. And, and there's right. just inherent limits. And a lot of times what does happen is, as you mentioned, on several points of that journey. Right. Is that capital one way or another becomes a constraint. It's like we can't we can't do this early on. Like you said, there wasn't this this sort of institutionalized rental product, so it just didn't work. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't buy and own single family rentals at any scale because no one was willing to sort of put institutional type debt that rates that made sense, and you had limits to what you could get. And you know, and now, of course, like you said, it's just we've seen in in the last ten years the institutionalization of really the whole. I mean, really, single family in general has become completely institutionalized, which to some might seem like, well, well, of course, but for those of us who've been in the business long enough, we know that institutional investors never really touched single family. Like they really had nothing to do with it until the great, you know, the, the, the global financial crisis hit and they decided to go long and just stumble their way into it and just go and sop up and buy a bunch of stuff. But that's what then led to really everything we, you referred to is just now all of a sudden, all these capital sources were willing to buy, you know, the first position debt on this short-term product, which never existed before. And then, but really a lot of it came out of is that the, the, the conventional banks, as you referred to, they just, re, they retreated, right? So they used to do a lots of different financing. You know, it was a pain in the butt and it took long. And like you said, it's sort of onerous, but it, it you know, they just, they kind of got out of it. It opened the whole door for really the private you know, you know, the side of the, the equation, you know, private lending and all that's the proliferation of that. And then of course the institutional money coming in to create that, that liquidity um, that, that really is all just happened in the last five to seven years. I mean, it, it never really ever had existed before then. Um, so you can see that journey, uh, your journey, you really highlights kind of that wave that's been ridden through here. So um, For sure. you know, I think it's interesting. And then it is, obviously you said you get into it and now on the lending side, it is much easier to kind of build process and grow and scale that. And now that you do have some secondary markets, you know, or some, the second you know, liquidity is really nice that to be able to do that. But like you said, not having discretionary capital in situations like that, it really can. So when the music stops, it doesn't mean that your assets are bad or they're not performing. It just means that right. you know you're sort of stuck, and now all of a sudden your business, like how are you going to originate new loans, 
right? So really, exactly. you know, that's what these debt funds, I try to tell people that, I mean, the debt funds have been around forever. Like, you know, my business partner, Matt, he's, he's been running a debt fund since 2001. You know, I got involved with them in 2008. So it's not like it, it's because it's a more efficient way to capitalize. Like you said, the fractionalized stuff is just it's way too many moving parts where you've got four different people that own a fractional interest of some, you know, some, uh, some real estate loan. It's just, it's, it doesn't, doesn't work. It's too complicated over time, but to put a bunch of these, you know, debt instruments or mortgages or trustees into, you know, one entity and have investors get sort of diversified exposure um, and those loans sort of roll off the books, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but the, but the, the end result right to that passive investor is, is, a, is really what amounts to a great fixed income equivalent or replacement which you can't really, you know, because you had equity and and you you know you had you had stocks and bonds, and the bond market was supposed to be that thing you could rely on as sort of like a fixed income. Well, that's like all messed up, and so it's like where can you get yield that's consistent, like literally that you can pay bills okay. with that that used to be more options, and now it's like it's it's hard to find. So to to realize like from a high net worth investor standpoint to have access to these sorts of these investment opportunities, like a debt fund, where you can put money in and actually get, you know, dis distributions or dividend payments on a monthly or quarterly basis, you can pay bills with that stuff. And the underlying assets, all things being equal, if you, which is what we'll kind of transition here in a second, but, you know, if, if, the, if the fund is full of first position or loans at, you know, a conservative loan to values, you know, risk on a risk adjusted basis, it's really hard to beat. You know, so I think that that's where it's a great it's a great solution to a problem that everyone has in their portfolio that needs a solution, which is you have to have some kind of fixed income in your you know yeah. in your portfolio. So, so I want to touch on one thing before we get there, though. So you guys, and I think it might make a little more sense to me now. Like you were Ashmore Partners, you rebranded to Builders Trust Capital. Was some of that right. because are you are you focusing more on some of the true? you know, construction lending type stuff? Like, is, is that a big part of what you do? Or is, is it like the builder's trust, like maybe give a little backstory on the rebrand and why you did it. And, and maybe I'm, sure. I'm getting more into it than is actually there, but. No, no, no. So, and, and, and by the way, I think well said on your kind of summary, I think that the yield and the search for yield really, I think is a main driver too of institutional capital flowing into what we do, right. And into the single family space, in general, but you know, if, if you can't get yield anywhere, then you know it, it's going to just eventually they're going to discover that hey, there's this huge untapped market that maybe we should yeah. um, think about. You know, I think there might be some principal agent problems with some of the things that are going on right now with securitizations and things like that. But um, in any event, uh, yeah. So the rebranding was it was driven by a couple of different things. So um, when we we wanted to rebrand, but not necessarily rename. Right, so we'd had the same branding for years, and um, again, it wasn't necessarily broken, but we thought that it could. We basically, when we launched the fund, we wanted to take a more institutionalized approach to it, and also kind of try to target a, a slightly different customer base. So, to your point, builders and like professional developers and builders. So when we then started, so we engaged someone to help us with that effort, right? With the logo, topography and things like that. They interviewed some of our clients and they interviewed some other third service providers and things like that. And one of the common themes actually was that Ashmore Partners is very kind of nondescript. It could be a lot of different things, right? It could be a law firm. It could be an accounting firm. It could be, it could be kind of whatever, right? Most people like the partners aspect, but you know, when you go out there, Ashmore Partners is like, okay, what do you do, right? If you're at a conference, you could do anything. So so it became kind of apparent to us that we probably should go with a name that was more descriptive of what we did, right? So the process that actually led us to build ourselves capital was a lot of brainstorming, a lot of Googling, because when you try to start any kind of company with capital in the name, they're almost all taken. So we're actually really kind of happy with where we ended up, Builders Trust Capital, it kind of, and then kind of the three pillars, if you will, in the logo, it's kind of like, you know, we provide capital for builders and, and we, you know, we put capital to work that we get from investors and, and everything is kind of built on trust, both on, on both sides of that spectrum, right? Both when we 
when we sell to our borrowers and we when we sell our prize to investors, it, it's built on trust. And I think you could appreciate this with you know trust and transparency. I mean, it's kind of so we, we kind of felt like we landed in a really good spot with a name and and so but that's kind of the backstory. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's I I certainly think it's more descriptive. And it's just a great name. The fact that, like you said, you could get you could get that. It's uh you get it right away. So for for you guys now then that you know from a strategy standpoint, once again, it's filling this void of I mean, clearly, you know, with the global financial crisis, just not enough homes were being built through that time frame. Yep. You know, I think what are they saying? We're three or four million units short. Um and uh, you know it's a huge problem, and but even a bigger problem is the fact that you know for for builders um, and developers access to capital for them it 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 just there's not it, there's not as much there's not an, as much as there used to be or just from the banks. So the banks, of course, the ones who got crushed <laughs> the last time, so they're sort of like they're always going to sit out at least one cycle uh, on the thing that burned them, and and that happens to be the one. So that's where groups like you kind of stepping in then and, and solving that problem for those who are trying to, you know, you know, build, build these homes. Right. I mean, like that's, you're their source of capital. So you've got a repeat borrower. And is that, is that sort of part of the deal? Sure. I mean, that's our, you know, it's always a lot harder to acquire new clients than it is to, you know, get more business from your current clients, I think. So at least if you do a nice job servicing your business, um, so yeah, I mean, we're trying to provide capital for, I mean, we do fix and flips, we do ground up, right? We do bridge loans, we do all those products, but, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a huge supply demand problem right now in that there's just, just not enough housing, yeah. right? And obviously it's hard to get more housing without capital. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's exactly what we try to do. So we still work with, so when we were smaller, so years ago, right, we were a smaller company and because of Anthony and my, back, my background, we were very happy to almost be like consultants, like free consultants for our borrowers, right? They were trying to flip houses to buy rental properties or whatever yeah. strategy they were trying to do. And we're still happy to do that. But I think the reality is when you scale, you just have, unfortunately, I have less time to talk to borrowers at that level. So we are trying to kind of grow the business by onboarding professional developers and builders and and less of the kind of the first time fix and flippers weekend warriors yeah. we're happy to do it um we just you know we we uh there's a couple of overlays to our guidelines um that that we use to kind of account for the fact that that experience at least in my in my experience and in my opinion experience in executing in these real estate strategies is very important because you know, there's a lot of TV shows out there that make it very easy, but I think the reality is that flipping a house is just, it's hard. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And the best way to, for us to know that someone can do it successfully is, is basically to verify that they've done it before successfully, yeah. right? Because you learn a lot on that first deal and even second deal and probably, you know, no two deals are ever going to be the exact same, but it's, um, you know, there's a learning curve there for sure. Yeah, that's right. And it goes to, once again, another... Thing near and dear to my heart it's track record i mean it's just it's it it, it it can't be discounted now you know when like you said i mean you said it perfectly it's just of course there's guys you know someone's got to everyone got to start someplace right and yep. so you know what that usually means is that the money will be more expensive why because there's more risk involved why because they don't have as much experience right they're not as profitable right. client you know that it's just that's just how this works but ult ultimately you know looking at that if you're going to lend money to somebody and they've done it repeatedly and you can verify and confirm that they have you that's a way to mitigate your risk i mean you're de-risking the deal right. and that's and right. you know and then and then too that's the volume play they're going to build their ability to build they've scaled their business or so their ability to flip more houses or build more houses or whatever you got to repeat borrower mm -hmm. you know all those things so that's that understand these yeah it might be that you could invest in builder trust capital you know their debt fund as a passive investor but with these sort of strategies, yeah, it's a financial product that's being offered by the issuer, but you can't separate, you know, who are, who's originating these loans, right? Who's originating them? Who's servicing them? Because especially with the with the the uh, construction lending or re, the rehab, the the draws and stuff. I mean, it, it's not it's it, it's not easy. Like, and you can get burned if you're not paying attention. So maybe head on some of those yep. things that you guys do. Great, you've got you know you're, you're gauging the experience of the borrower. You're extending, you know, you're you're lending them money to sort of execute their projects. 
but ultimately you're not just like, oh yeah, here's a $400,000 loan, you know, good luck. You're saying, well, here's 180. Uh, okay. This should get, you know, cover the purchase, you know, and then show us progress right. and, and then we'll advance you additional funds. Right. Yep. That's right. And just to, to touch on just one part of like the newer investor investor being one of our borrowers, right. Who wants to fix a fix and flip a house. Like what we try to do because we've been in their shoes is, and some borrowers appreciate this and some borrowers don't, the ones who don't might not be a good fit for us, but we really do try to guide them along. Right. And say, look, if you have $20,000 and you want to try to do a $500,000 flip, that's probably not a good idea because you have, you don't want to over lever yourself. Right. So you might be able to find someone to lend you that money, but I would recommend that you either do a smaller project or you get some more capital so that you can be well enough capitalized to make sure you don't get into trouble. Right. Because leverage is a great tool, but it also could be a little bit dangerous for a bar, right? A lender can end up putting a oh. borrower in a bad position if they don't, if yeah. they're not careful. Yeah. Um, so, but on the construction side, because I think, you know, you, we try to mitigate a lot of our risk before we ever originate a loan, obviously, but then once the loan is originated, then most of the risk then is in the construction, right? Especially if it's kind of a larger project. So we do a couple of things in the construction side. So we have construction expertise in house. So we have a construction department. And so what that means is that before we originate a loan, so during our underwriting process, um, one of our construction guys goes to the property physically, walks the property with the budget, and that serves a couple of different purposes. First of all, it makes sure that there's nothing like unforeseen, right? That the borrower hasn't seen or maybe that wasn't caught in the appraisal or things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So like are there foundation issues that somehow were overlooked, yep. right? Is there you know, anything like that? And the second thing that it does, it is make sure is that let's say that it's a $50,000 budget. Is that $50,000 budget actually sufficient, right? Because being underfunded on the construction side is very, not a good place to be as a borrower or a lender. Right, you want to mitigate that before we do the loan, right? So let's say that that budget really should be 70, not 50. We would restructure the loan, and if the deal still works, great. If it doesn't, then we might say to the borrower, look, that you need a $70,000 budget, not 50. Right. To your earlier points, some of these, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a flipper, you're probably optimistic, which is, you know, by nature, uh, or at least, you know, so. Yeah. But you have to, but you have to be realistic, right? So we also make sure that the budget is sufficient. Then what we'll do is we'll vet the borrower's contractor, right? So a lot of our professional borrowers are, you know, they have their own contracting companies that we know well, right? So they have kind of an investing company, but then they also have their own crews. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a new borrower to us, we'll vet them. We'll look at the last couple of deals they did to make sure that they actually are capable of executing whatever project that they want us to fund. That's all done, you know, pre us originating the loan. So then, I'm sorry. No, yeah, yeah, you said, yeah, exactly. See, it's like you said, you haven't, you okay. haven't lent its red scent yet. I mean, this is, this is, do, do, right. and due and diligence. Don't, this is underwriting. It is, and we don't charge any application fees. So this is kind of a risk on us just in terms of time and effort, right? Um, but I also like to think it's a very good service for our borrowers. So I, I would like to think that we've steered clients away from bad deals many times because of the construction aspect, right? So, um, it helps, obviously it helps us and our investors, but it also helps our, bar, our borrowers, I think. So assuming that everything is in order and it's a $50,000 budget, right? We'll get, usually we'll get a line, not usually, we'll get a line itemized budget, right? So what is that $50,000 actually made up of? It's not just, oh, it's a flat 50,000, right? So demo, permits, framing, HVAC, rough plumbing, you know, whatever those line items are. And then, you know, that all, all check out, it verifies, we then build that $50,000 budget into the loan, all right? So out of the loan amount, 50,000 of it is for the rehab of this property. Now we hold that back and we don't give it to the borrower until work is completed, right? So let's say that, you know, now they've done the demo, they pulled the permits, they've done the framing, rough plumbing, rough electric. And on our line itemized budget, that adds up to $20,000. They send us an email, give us a call and say, look, I'm ready for my first draw. Here's what I did. We'll go to the property. We'll inspect it. We'll make sure that those things are actually completed. 
Yeah. Right. And depending on what those things are, if it's something that requires permits, we would make sure that it was inspected and passed the inspections. Right. Um, assuming that it did and that they did $20,000 worth of work, we will then give them $20,000 out of that $50,000 budget. Now they have 30 left, second inspection, third, whatever, we'll do the same thing. That's how we disperse the rehab draws. Yeah. And seeing that's where so a lot of people, it's like they, I mean, and rightfully so. I mean, you realize like, yeah, you're lending to people. If they're coming out of the ground, it's riskier than just doing a rehab more often than not. Right. Like in, in, but you see this process is that the lending process, like, just like, in a, I mean, as a passive investor your process should be very similar. Who are the people involved? You got to check things through. Like you, you need to conduct due diligence um, as much as you can to check these things out, to see, like you said, who's the general contractor or who's the property manager. If you're going to invest in a equity syndication, like all of those things, like just digging into them and touching them and make sure they make sense. Okay. You know, to your point, you dig in one and go like this GC is no good. Like this isn't a good match. This guy's never done a project this size or, or whatever the case may be. Those are all ways that you can mitigate the risk along the way. And, and, and once again, to stack the deck in your favor so that, when you know when you go and do the project that that to the degree that success is is achieved you sort of should be generating whatever your returns like you charge the borrower x you mitigate as much risk as you can that's how you generate an above average risk adjusted return for your end user investors and everyone wins yeah. right and not to right. mention you set the bar you set your borrower up for success along the way because it's like keeping them on track and and the early mm -hmm. warning sort of signs of something's not going as it should be is all part of, you know, what, what makes this work. So when you know, you're ever, if you're an investor listening to this and, you know, thinking about investing in debt funds and stuff like that, it's not just, you can't just become fixated on what kind of returns you have. And then whoever has the highest number, like invest in their fund, like that's just a really bad strategy. Um, <laughs> you, you really, you, you have to dig in and figure out who are these people? What are they doing? Who are they lending to? Where are they lending it at? All of those things matter. And then you can do your assessment and ask yourself, hey, do I believe that this is a good return for me? And do I believe that they're capable of, of doing this? And, you know, but not just glomming on to the, to the number. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying. And I've seen it too many times where it's like people offering 15% returns or something on, and they just have none of the stuff in place that you said. And, and you can go backwards really quick, uh, really, really quick. Uh, where you've now got a lender who, you know, holds title a bunch of properties they had to foreclose on and has no idea. That's the other thing with you guys. Worst case scenario, you had to foreclose on something. You actually have done it before, right? You actually would know what to do with it because you've you've done right. that. That's another thing that, you know, that's a feather in your cap. Not every lender can say that. Um, and most banks are terrified. They don't, they hate owning the real estate. They don't know what to do with it. And that's yeah. where they often lose a lot of their money. So, um, yeah. so, uh, so talk to us about kind of, you guys are in what the New Jersey area or like, so tell us kind of the markets that you lend in. Is there, you know, how far afield do you go and, and, you know, what's kind of that, yeah, wh which are the markets? Tell us about the markets that you're sure. lending. Sure. So historically we've been in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and really mostly Eastern Pennsylvania and, and really Philadelphia market, sub markets. Okay. Um, we recently expanded into Virginia, Maryland, D.C., and also Florida. Um, so when I say expanded, that means we, you know, have done the due diligence and hired some people to be able to lend there, right? So that's another thing. And I think you're right that you have to kind of look behind the curtain, right? So we like to try to do our due diligence to get set up before we start lending, right? So we have an account executive in Florida. We have not yet closed a loan in Florida, but we will be hopefully soon. But we kind of got boots on the ground there. Mm before we did loans there, right? Because we want to understand the markets that we're in. Yeah. Um, so in terms of New Jersey and PA, I mean, you know, obviously real estate is very kind of at a micro level, especially in New Jersey, there's a lot of, you know, small kind of sub markets. But I mean, relatively speaking, the markets were in have been strong, um, just like most of, I guess, the real estate markets have since, uh, since COVID. Um, I wouldn't say that it's probably not anything too different from what we're seeing in the national level, you know, lots of appreciation, not a lot of deal flow, right? For obvious reasons, there's just, you know, there, there's just not a lot of REOs, share sales are starting to happen again. Um, but, you know, so New Jersey, for instance, there's a very big difference between kind of Northern New Jersey and the New York City 
submarkets, and then Southern New Jersey, which are more the Philadelphia submarkets. But again, the way we underwrite our loans and the diligence we do is is very similar, right? So there's, I mean, in Philadelphia, it's a lot of row homes. Uh, sometimes it'll be kind of a two story, and the and the um, and the the kind of strategy is an add a level, so it becomes a three store, and you create a lot of value that way, right? Mm-hmm. That happens in similar ways in northern New Jersey in some of those areas where they'll take kind of a rancher and they'll do an add-a level, right? So a lot of the strategies are similar in the sense that our borrowers are trying to create value one way or the other. And it's, it could be by expanding, this, you know, extending this, you know, a square footage addition, or it could just be cosmetic, um, could be ground up, right? There's a lot of new construction going on in Jersey City, Hoboken, North Bergen, you know, those Mm-hmm. you know, New York City suburbs. So um, this kind of depends on the area. But again, the, the kind of the way that we approach a deal, the way we underwrite them and what we look at both at the asset level and the borrower level really doesn't change too much. Yeah. So tell me about like what what led to sort of the exploration of Florida and like in what market or, or what markets in particular are down there? Just curious to, I mean, obviously Florida is a pretty hot market and it looks like it's going to have the staying power along with, you know, some of these other Sunbelt markets, but maybe give sort of the insight into what led to, to kind of looking down there. And um, yeah. I mean, that's really the main reason, Uh, like you said, there's, you know, there's just a lot of population influx, right? So there's a lot of construction and development in Florida. Um, Like you said, I think, I don't think that's going to go away. And I think there's a lot of Northeast transplants in Florida, right? So there's a lot of, I think, um, just culturally, maybe it's not that different. Um, so really, we just like what's going on down there in terms of growth and activity. And I don't think it's transient. So, um, and I think it's even skewing younger, right? I mean, traditionally, it's a kind of a retirement maybe type state, but it seems like there's more and more younger people moving to Florida as well, right? Starting families and, you know, I mean, Jacksonville, for instance, and Port Jacks just has a ton of activity. Um, and that's, I think, very similar in a lot of areas of Florida. Wow. So we kind of want to just capture that. And also just, you know, additional dis- diversification in the portfolio, right? So being, you know, having some exposure to other areas besides the Northeast. Yep. Cool. So yeah, this has been really good stuff. So what you know, where can people, you know, learn more about you guys? And if they're curious to sort of follow up and, you know, where, what's the best way to kind of get a hold of you and learn more? Well, we are in Verivest. So you can always, you can look there. You can find us there. Uh, Builderstresscapital.com. It's our website. You can contact us through that. Um, I don't know if I can leave my content information somewhere, but my email is peter at Builderstresscapital.com. And, um, you know, I love talking about this stuff. So if anyone ever wants to reach out and just shoot the breeze or if they're interested in investing or borrowing, always happy to talk to anyone. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much for your time, Peter. It's always good catching up and you have a great day. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate it. 